the time was practically three, five to three. Five to three in the afternoon. In the afternoon, yes. And Daphne was going out from her home. That's her house over there at the top of the hill. Exactly. Just behind that dry stone wall. Exactly. And there's a lot of trees around. Usually she parks her car inside the residence for safety. At that particular day, so on the 16th of October, she parked her car outside her house near the gate. Beside a narrow, lonely road in Malta, it's a rare rural spot on this small, built-up Mediterranean island, crime reporter Joe McAuliffe is reconstructing the last minutes in the life of a woman whose name, shortly afterwards, would ricochet around the world. Malta's most prominent blogger, scourge of her country's authorities, Daphne Caruana Galizia. So she went out from her house, entered her car, and uh, she started going down. The road starts to descend immediately outside her house, down into this little valley. Exactly, exactly. Then, 80 metres from her home, the first explosion. It was the activation of the bomb. The car continued going down three, four seconds after. It was a huge explosion. That was the second one. The car ended not in the first field, but at the second one. So the car was flung right across into this field? Exactly. Then here uh, it took place the third bomb due to the um, explosion of the fuel tank. Three explosions at all. It was horrific. Eh? It was horrific. The body entered into pieces. Eh? All around here, pieces of her body. It was a very big shock. That particular bomb killed not an ordinary woman, but uh, a particular person who was writing against corruption. Even those who didn't know Daphne's blog know about it now. The assassination of that fearless, forensic, acid-tongued woman has cast an unprecedented and unflattering spotlight on this rocky island between Italy and Libya. Malta is the European Union's smallest state. It has fewer than half a million people. The sun is glinting on the waves below the massive medieval ramparts of its capital, Valletta, and the rigging of the moored yachts is tinkling in the breeze. Malta was known to most outsiders just as an English-speaking holiday or retirement destination and as a place celebrated for its collective bravery in World War II when it was still a British colony. But after Daphne's death, her son called it a mafia state. Three men have been charged with the murder, but civil society campaigners fear that the authorities want to cover up the real story behind the killing. So what's happening on Malta? Well, it depends who you ask, because, as Daphne herself said, there are two Maltas coexisting on an island that you can drive across in half an hour. This is what one Malta thinks about her death. There's no doubt in my mind that this is a political killing, that uh, the motivations in order for this to happen are so strong and the benefits for people in politics are so high that I will find it very difficult to be persuaded uh, that there's any other reason for this to have happened. And the other Malta? We're very sorry for her death. But it was her fault. She was so cruel with everyone. If, you, if you're in the middle of the, of the road, if you're hit by a car, it is your fault because you're in the middle of the road. So you are expecting to be hit by a car. You know what I mean? For Crossing Continents, I've come to Malta to find out why a journalist acclaimed around the world was such a divisive figure in her own country. My wife was killed because she mattered. Because the powerful were afraid of her. That's Daphne's husband, Peter. The family haven't spoken to the media, but Peter gave this address at a memorial meeting at the European Parliament. To say my wife was brave is true. But bravery alone has little value without a sense of purpose, without a sense of injustice, and without the capacity for outrage. Outrage? Daphne expressed that day after blistering day. Here she is in 2013, 
after a police raid on her sparked by a complaint about her writing. You don't expect to be in a new member state and have the police investigating and interrogating people for writing about politics on the internet. It is beyond appalling. It's shocking. And the police cannot understand why I will not sit at home quietly and not write anything about politics. Said, but that, from a TV interview, is a rare public recording of her voice. What Daphne wrote on her blog, Running Commentary, was devoured by almost the whole country. But when she wasn't blogging, she was tending her beloved garden, spending time with her three sons, editing the lifestyle magazine, Taste and Flair, that she earned a living from. She wasn't somebody who would, uh, on a face-to-face -face basis, take over the conversation in a group. That's Daphne's friend from childhood, Petra Caruana Dingley. She was quite a quiet person. She would be more listening than necessarily talking and not that easy for people to know so closely. She worked constantly. She had a great big laptop and she carried it around and when she had a moment in between meetings or wherever she was going, she would stop somewhere and work at great speed. Cut it out, you blethering idiots. You're embarrassing Malta and the Labour Party internationally with your sub-literacy vulgarity stupidity. First, they install a crony in every post. Then they change the rules. For the past four and a married man with five children should be at home with them on Sunday morning and not at a party club behind the bar making Nescafe for total She was strangers. trusted in the sense that she had repeatedly refused to reveal sources. So she was filling a gap in journalism where people were ready to send her information and she was ready to bring it out in her own name. She was also used to receiving threats, which was a very uh, awful thing over the years. She had arson attacks on her house twice. She had a, her dog poisoned. But otherwise, she carried on writing as before, as strongly, if not more strongly, as before. There are crooks everywhere you look now. The situation is desperate. And I am not here to do what they don't do. I am here because I saw the example of Daphne Caruana Galizia, who literally, literally gave up her life every day of her life, not just the day she died, because she wanted to say no, she wanted to challenge the realities that we were accepting. And none of us are perfect, least of all me. But I'm not going to shut up. That's the blogger Manuel Delia. He's speaking at one of Malta's smartest hotels, where journalists have gathered to discuss how to continue Daphne's work. You should, say, you should speak about it. It's not the business of journalism to document every single thing that I do. If you are the story, if you're being intimidated, why not publish it? Suffer an expropriation. Manuel's a former official of Malta's right-wing opposition party, the Nationalists. And, as he tells me later, Daphne was his mentor when he started blogging. Just a few months later, she was killed. I was at my desk and a friend of mine uh, called me and he said, uh, I think they got Daphne. So what was your first thought? I didn't think much, I cried mostly. And the reason is I cried because I was uh, shocked, I was frightened, I was angry. Because as she dug up over the last four years, she was discovering an extent of rot and an extent of corruption uh, hitherto unknown in this country. Daphne built up slowly to the revelation of her greatest, most explosive scoop. One day last February, she posted, without comment, a picture of a Panama hat. Then, a week later, this. Some of my readers might even have thought that I was having a bad hair day, so to speak, as the post seemed inexplicable. But they were not aimed at my readers. They were aimed at that audience of just four people. I wanted to see what they would do next. The four people? Daphne soon revealed who they were. Her story was that within 48 hours of being elected in 2013, the Prime Minister's Chief of Staff, uh, the Prime Minister's favourite minister, and someone else who in the Panama Papers is described as more important than them too, were with the Prime Minister's personal accountant setting up secret accounts in Panama. Daphne's information came from the Panama Papers, the millions of files leaked last year from an offshore law firm. The favourite minister 
was the only cabinet member of any EU country who was shown to have a secret account in Panama. And was someone else more important? That, Daphne alleged, was the Prime Minister's wife, Michelle Muscat, who she said controlled an account in a private bank in Malta, an account which had received a one million euro payment from the daughter of the President of Azerbaijan. Azerbaijan, by the way, just happens to be deeply involved in lucrative energy deals with Malta. Daphne's claims, all hotly denied, were so explosive they triggered a general election. But the Labour Prime Minister, Joseph Muscat, won that vote with a clear majority. It took its toll on her, everything she was facing in response. What, how did it take its toll on her? Her mood was certainly very despondent. She felt more alone than ever. And, and she was. She was alone. And the, what she had revealed would have convinced any electorate to do away with someone who was clearly profiting from office. Uh, but it wasn't enough. And it wasn't enough. And she knew it wouldn't be, I think, because uh, that's the two Maltas she was talking about. And then we like to think that Maltese culture is European. The reality is that there are really two Maltas and the European bit is the insignificant bit. So she talked about two Maltas. Well, it is a Malta of a minority, which is uh, strict on public propriety and private propriety, of doing the right thing. And a larger Malta that is willing to compromise with that and approaches right or wrong on the basis of how it would benefit them. That explains how people would have corrupt politicians and vote for them. Days after Daphne's murder, campaigners, women in particular, were on the streets, infuriated by what they saw as the government's attempt to carry on with business as usual, outraged that the policeman heading the murder inquiry is married to a government minister. But even by Maltese standards, the protests are relatively small, and the participants are mainly middle-class professional people from the better off nationalists supporting north of the island. They're from Daphne's Malta, not the other one, which Daphne said was personified not just in its politics, but even in its taste by Labour Prime Minister Joseph Muscat. So cheap and tacky and sleazy. Truly a suitable Prime Minister for an island which has been overtaken by militant chavs while they avidly pursue the trappings of materialism. Cars, suits, clothes, houses, swimming pools, wine-tasting holidays in Asti. They have no idea of the real codes of behaviour that immediately separate the wheat from the horrid chaff. They're god-awful. One long, horrid parade of appalling taste, Hugo Chavez attitudes, indifference to protocol and hideously bad manners. Just reading her blog, I mean, she was driven up the wall by the, the clothes people were wearing, by the way people spoke. Yes, yes. Many people considered her elitist, and I don't think she would have disagreed with that. But there's a cultural background to that, a historical background, which is specific to Malta. She came from that very narrow band of Maltese people that descend from, I would call them the colonial loyalists, pro-British, a community of people, I would say not more than 15, 20% of Malta, that retained values of etiquette, of propriety and proper behaviour, stiff upper lip, things you'd get from a British tradition. That contrasts with a more lacadaisical, Mediterranean attitude of mediocrity. And that uh, second Malta, what you're saying yourself, is that larger Malta. What, what did they think of her? They called her the Witch of Bidnia, the Queen of Bile, and these are descriptions that would go in record. And that's also after she died. So after she died, there were some, not, not one or two, there was a vicious campaign of hatred uh, over social media. There was a very enthusiastic crowd here, as you can hear. Most of them got glasses of beer in their hand. And the Prime Minister is just about to arrive. The Prime Minister of Malta, Mr. Joseph Muscat, is the best Prime Minister in the world. Why? What's so good because about he, him? He cares, he cares so much for us Maltese. In what way? In, in, in every because way. In every way. Different. It's Sunday morning, and I'm outside the Labour Club in the narrow streets of Birgu. It's an old working-class port 
that like everywhere else in Malta, is only a short drive from where Daphne lived. But there's not much sympathy for her here. She said that all the women from Cotonera, that is the three cities here, are bitches. She used that word? Yes, yes, yes. Like she used when our old prime minister died, Dom Mintoff, that he did a lot of good things in Malta. And she said, may he rot in hell. Definitely for us was like irrelevant. Is it like a social thing, is it? Yes. Social, social thing, social, social thing. Both. That is about these 5,000 people from Malta that they think that are superior than the other 480,000 in Malta. So you're saying you think that she was like elitist? You think she was a snob? Yes, You think she was a snob? Yes, she snobbed us. She snobbed us. Prime Minister, the BBC, can we ask you one question? What do you think all the concerns, you've just won an election, but there's all these concerns now from the European Parliament about rule of law in Malta, democracy in Malta. Well, always, what do you say to that? We're always very open to scrutiny. We have nothing to hide and we actually want to engage and we're very open to that. I have total confidence in the police force and I think that time will tell that we're right in putting the confidence in our institutions. He's the best Prime Minister in the world. He's made Malta ten times better than what it was eight years ago. Malta's intensely political, but it's deeply partisan in other ways too. Almost every village has not one, but two wind bands that compete at the annual fiesta. Bands that rehearse all year in their clubhouses as well as making their own fireworks in breathtaking quantities. These are the trumpets, tubas and clarinets of Santa Maria Assunta in Gudia. The club's chairman is Omar Shwereb. You can imagine when you come in front of the other band club, you know, you see people jumping and, you know, singing with hymns, you know, that we are the best. Omar's club is refurbishing its already impressive headquarters another fruit of the growing prosperity that helps explain the government's re-election, a prosperity that Omar, who's an estate agent, appreciates every day in his job. The government invested so much in the southern part of the island, like regenerating areas, properties, you know, and people invest. Property market is booming in the south, price range went high. Yes. Automatically, the, the standard of living goes up. You can see teenagers buying cars, as soon as they're 18, you know, they buy a house. But there's another background sound to Malta's economic success, and it's this. Online betting businesses, like the ones exhibiting at this huge convention here, are attracted by very low tax rates for foreign-based firms, and the industry brings in expats who contribute to the property boom. But Daphne believed that the industry also brought in dirty money. And she was appalled, too, at another of Malta's new sources of wealth, the official selling of Maltese passports to wealthy foreigners. You can legally become a Maltese, and therefore also an EU citizen, for 650,000 euros. Though Daphne said that referral fees and bribes sometimes ease the transaction. and all their enablers, including the lawyers and corporate service providers who jumped on the sale of passports bandwagon like starving people as soon as they were given a cut, should be lined up and shot at dawn for what they have done to the rest of us. That gurgling sound? Malta's future going down the plug hole. But if Daphne was worried about her country's declining reputation, her family, friends and supporters, her Malta, are even more worried about what's happened since her death. Visiting members of the European Parliament talked of a perception of impunity. Daphne's family has sought advice from a top London law firm who called for external, impartial investigators to be involved in the murder inquiry. That enraged the government. But Daphne's friends, including the blogger Manuela de Lea, are worried that the police may only be focusing on forensic evidence, not on the financial transactions that could reveal who commissioned the murder. This is not just about finding the guy who was pushing the button. This is also about the environment that has been created here that she was uh, revealing. 
The facts that we know are that there are people that are attached to the mafia, to the Azerbaijani regime, that have had every motivation to eliminate Daphne Caruana Galizia. Just let me put the opposite argument to you, which would be, surely the death of, of a major journalist is a disaster for people in power. Look at the spotlight, the extraordinarily negative spotlight that's now being turned on everything in Malta. You, you would think so in a normal democracy, but five days after she was killed, the Prime Minister was on a plane to Dubai to sell passports. That is the attitude of business as, as usual, of turning the page as quickly as possible, that the government took when this happened. And in trying to get this story to be accepted as a story that uh, is only related to the underworld, what the government also wants to do is actually gain a political advantage. Well, the number two in that government is the Deputy Prime Minister of Malta, Chris Fern. Deputy Prime Minister, let me ask you, the death of Daphne Caruana Galizia, mm. how much damage has that done, do you think, to Malta's image? Well, uh, yes, this is not something which is normal for Malta, so it's not just a question of reputation. And, of course, the best way to, to deal with it is to give the police all the resources possible that we can to get to the bottom of this case. You say, obviously, the police investigation is going on, it should be independent, we can't comment on it, but yeah. people point to the fact that the chief police investigator in this case is married to a government minister. It doesn't look like independence of, of the police, or does it? We're a small island and people marry each other. Um, and the person you happen to mention has been a police officer since 1993, so practically 25 years. So he's one of the best investigative uh, officers we have for homicides. So I don't think it's, it's a very valid argument to say just because a police officer happens to be married to somebody in politics then he should be excluded from investigating any, any murders at all. It's maybe because it's a small country, it's so hard to keep things separate. I mean, I think Malta is the only EU country that turned out to have a government minister who actually had a secret account in Panama. In the only, Euro the again, only EU country. Again, there are... Nobody is above the law here in this country. And there are a number of inquiries going on into that involvement. So far, nothing's been proven. Uh, finally, in relation to um, Daphne, you said a criminal murder. Yes. But, but of course, at least one major not Maltese paper on the day afterwards, and it's from Page, said political murder. Yes. Well, you mustn't believe everything you read in the newspapers, must you? So I'm sure people will say many other, many, many things. It remains up to the magistrate who's inquiring to, to come up with the answer, and we'll, we'll wait for that report. So I say yes. In Daphne's case, this is definitely something criminal. And well, what reason do you have to say it's not something political? But why should you say it is? Very simply, because she was trying to un uncover very specifically what she saw as, as political corruption. That if you look at who might have had a motive, you come back instantly to the political sphere. Yes, but that doesn't necessarily follow that her killing was political, or was politically instigated, certainly not. We'll wait for the magisterial inquiry, and it is ongoing. That's not the only magisterial inquiry that's ongoing. There are several others, too, into Daphne's corruption allegations but civil society activists question how much progress they'll make, especially after what's happened to a police investigator who started looking into her allegations while she was still alive. You know, every time, uh, you know, uh, before taking the kids to school, I check the car, you know, I start the engine, go around the block, you know, something happens, happens all to me. In a narrow terraced house full of old-fashioned dark wood furniture and statuettes of the Virgin and Saints, Jonathan Ferris is feeding his Mexican finches. Jonathan loves animals, but even more, he loved his job in the financial investigation unit of the police, a job he lost six months ago, just as he was about to probe the claims about a secret account held by the Prime Minister's wife. No reason was given. He was on probation in that job, so his bosses didn't need to. But Jonathan has got no doubt what it was about. The real reason was that I was too sharp for them and they didn't want me to dig too deeply into the government affairs, point blank. 
Since then, and particularly since Daphne's murder, he's convinced that he too is on a hit list. He's bound to be nervous because he says he's a ticking time bomb of information, material he's gathered about Malta's elite. He'd be breaking secrecy rules if he told me now, but next month, at a court hearing to challenge his dismissal, he hopes that he'll be able to get those rules lifted. Then all hell will break loose because I will start to name people, ministers, officials, who were all embroiled in the scandal. What effect do you think that will have? Well, I think the commissioner will have a headache because he'll have to arrest a lot of people. They've created all this mess. They have to clean it up now. I've written some notes and memoirs that uh, should something happen to me, they will all be published. Everything you discovered? Yeah, I've got a very good photographic memory. You've written all that down and you've deposited it yes. somewhere? Not somewhere, many places. But this explosive material? Yes, explosive material. One of my posts in August said Hiroshima and Nagasaki will come soon. That's some threat. But in the superheated, shrill world of Maltese politics, it's hard to know how seriously to take it. For now, the formal processes of Maltese justice, the murder and corruption inquiries, grind on. The government, cheered on by that larger Malta, says that all that is the very stuff of proper governance. Daphne, though, would have called it a sham, the preservation of the status quo. I have built most of my career and my reputation on being anti-establishment. I have made an entire life out of it. In the postcard pretty port of Marsa Schlock, with its brightly coloured fishing boats, the rock church, and the local smuggling mafia that the tourists don't hear about, the weekly market is in full swing. Women here have always shouted to sell octopus. Daphne would have said, they didn't shout in public for much else. But her voice lives on, shouting louder perhaps in death than ever before. An anti-establishment woman flies right in the face of southern Mediterranean culture. I break all their rules. But they are their rules. If I were anywhere else, I would not be anti-establishment. I would simply be normal. But what is considered normal in Malta is abnormal elsewhere. Malta hasn't caught up. <laughs>